Hey, it's your financial maven, Samantha Mittman Besnoff, CPA. And after almost 25 years in the accounting world, I've decided to share my insights and passion about money. Knowing your money and hopefully feeling less stressed about your money is what I call being financially empowered. Welcome to the Your Financial Maven podcast. All right, guys, I'm back with another Do You Know Your Money mini-sodes. And I'm going to spend the next couple of episodes, probably two or three, talking about individual personal taxes. There are things that you can do to get yourself ready for tax season. And I'm talking about tax season in the United States. I do not do any foreign tax returns. So some of the stuff that I'm talking about may apply to you if you live in another country, but I am gearing it towards U.S.-based individual tax payers. So we're going to talk about the personal 1040 individual tax return and hopefully get you ready for tax season because there's several important things that you need to do to ensure accurately reporting of your income and your deductions, hopefully minimize your tax liability, and of course, meet all of the legal requirements. So before I get into a checklist that I have, there are some important dates and information that you need to be aware of. First, I'm going to let you know that your W-2 and most of the tax forms are not required to be sent out to you until the end of January. I see all of the time that people are like, let's file in January when e-file opens up. Honestly, I would wait. I would wait till mid-February to start getting everything ready to file. I know that people are out there going, but I want my refund. Absolutely. If you are an early filer and you know you're going to be getting a refund and you have all your tax documents, absolutely file early. But I will tell you, if you are not just a W-2 wage earner or have your own small business, and even if you are, you're going to potentially have other documents. For example, you might have a 1099 interest form, which shows interest that you may have earned at a bank or another investment. And typically you get those for $10 or more, but you can see them for less. And you have to remember that with these tax documents, they don't just come to you. That W-2 that you get, whether it's still by paper, in mail, or electronically, that also gets filed with the Social Security Administration and the IRS. Same thing with any 1099 forms that you may receive. So just keep that in mind. Business returns. I know I'm talking individual, but it's important because there are individuals out there that might be in a partnership or a shareholder, an S corporation, and there's a form that you would get as a partner or a shareholder called a K-1. There's also a couple of additional K forms that you may receive, but the main one is a K-1. And those businesses, those partnerships, those S corporations, their business returns are not due until March 15th. So if you have not received those forms, you may not get them until March 15th. And if they file an extension on that business return, that most likely means you on your personal return would have to file an extension because you haven't received those forms yet. So it's very important that you follow through with any partnerships or as corporations that you may be a part of. And on to your personal returns for federal and state, they will normally be due April 15th unless it's moved by the IRS because of holidays or it's on a weekend. But also check, I know here in the state of Pennsylvania, we have local taxes to file, which are also due April 15th. So please make sure you are filing your federal, state, and potentially local returns by the due date. The beauty that the IRS gives you is you can file an extension. It's due six months from April 15th, typically October 15th. That's only an extension to file your personal income tax return for federal and state. That's not an extension to pay. So if you think while you're filing your return or working on your tax return that you are going to potentially owe you need to make a payment by April 15th. So even if you extend your return, that doesn't extend the time to pay. If you don't pay when you have an extension because either you're not sure if you owe money or you just are like, forget it, I'll wait until the return is filed, there could potentially be interest and penalties on that payment amount. So just keep that in mind that if you do file for an extension, that is only for an extension to file, not to pay. Now that I've gone through some of the dates, I'm going to go through this checklist. It not only helps you, but if you are using a CPA or if you're using a tax preparer, somebody else preparing your return, having this stuff in order will also help them. So number one is to gather your financial documents. You know, the forms we already talked about, your W-2 forms that you get 
as your earnings from your employer, any 1099 forms. If you're freelancing, that would be what's called a 1099 NEC, which is non-employee compensation. But there are other forms. If you sell a house, if you sell stock, there are 1099 forms you need to be aware of. Any receipts and records, you want to gather those for any deductible expenses, medical expenses, charitable contributions, business expenses, any kind of investment statements. These investment statements will typically show you your dividends, interests, and any capital gains or losses you may have received from any stock or other investments you may have sold. And that includes digital assets. Please be aware that if you have digital assets and you are selling them, there is potential tax on that. You also have potential deductions with your mortgage, so you want to make sure you're getting all your mortgage interest statements from your bank. Any kind of education-related forms, those are typically the 1098-T for tuition. There is also a 1099-Q, which is related to 529 distributions, so you need to be aware of that. And of course, you need to be aware of whose name it's in and whose social security number. And in fact, with all of these forms, you should be checking your name, checking your social security number, because the IRS will match your name to your social security card. And if your name is not correct on the return, your return will get rejected when you go to file it. So very important when you file your return that your name matches your social security card. And that goes for any dependents that you're including as well. If you're going to prepare your own return, there are different software that you can use. But note that the majority, especially if you live in a state like Pennsylvania where you have to file local taxes, Those tax softwares will only file federal and state. You're going to have to file local separate. So you need to keep that in mind. If you are preparing your own return, it is really a good idea to review your previous year's return. You want to use it for reference. You want to use it for consistency in reporting. So take a look at what you did the prior year just to make sure you don't miss anything. Then you need to make sure your records are organized. You want to keep all of your financial documents and records organized, make sure they're accessible, however you choose to do that. You can have them in envelopes. They can be digital. You know, if you have them set up on like a Google Drive or a OneDrive, it's really great, especially when you go to sit down with a CPA or a tax preparer. They do appreciate having organized documentations. I mean, believe me, I've seen it all. I even saw the shoebox of receipts years ago when I was preparing somebody's tax return and I had to go through every single receipt to recreate their income and their expenses that they had. And then when you're done, you've got everything organized and you're ready to sit down. If you're filing yourself, you need to know what your filing status is. Now, if you're working with a tax preparer, you're working with a CPA, they're going to ask you that. And that's an important part of filing. If you were single in 2022, and you got married in 2023, you need to make that decision how you're going to file, whether married filing jointly or in some cases, not in all married filing separate. So that's definitely something you need to pay attention to. Understanding tax law changes. You still need to be aware of the tax law changes. Tax law changes will impact your return. There's credits that could be affected, income thresholds, deductions. IRS just recently raised the limits for 401k and IRA limits. So you need to know those things. And if you're not sure, you can always research it. The best thing to do, in my opinion, is to see if you're able to find somebody who is a professional in the arena of tax work and can help you out with that. And then you need to look what things might be deductions and credits. You know, there could be an earned income tax credit. You could have child tax credits. There's deductions for student loan interest, retirement contributions, and you may have itemized deductions. If your itemized deductions are above whatever the standard deduction that the IRS gives you, then You need to have the list of your charitable contributions, your medical, but you also have to remember that those items have to meet certain floors and limits and thresholds. The standard deductions have been pretty high. So you need to be aware of that because that does reduce your adjusted gross income, which can affect your taxable income in a more positive light. It'll reduce your taxable income and then you won't necessarily pay as much taxes on that. And of course, when to file your returns electronically. So here's the first thing I suggest that you do before you file your returns as part of getting organized is go to the IRS's website, irs.gov, irs.gov, and set up your account. I think on the main page, it says to set up your account. Set it up so that you can go in and pull prior returns, prior transcripts, see current information like payments you may have made, if you made estimated tax payments, payments that you made in prior years, maybe there's notices and things like that. One of the other things that you can do when you have your irs.gov account set up is obtain an identity pin. Now, these identity pins were originally called identity theft pins. 
And what they were for is if you had any fraud or fraudulent tax returns that were filed in your name, in your social security number, the IRS needed to be able to identify who you were. So you had to obtain these identity fraud pins. While COVID came about, the ability to file everything for your taxes more electronically, meaning the IRS had to shift and do more things online, and they continue to do more things online, they need to have a way to really identify you as a taxpayer. So they shifted, and now it's just called an identity PIN. Now, the IRS highly recommends, and I highly recommend, that you set up your identity PIN. And you can do this through your irs.gov account. And it is set up for each individual taxpayer. And I think it's very important to have that this way you can guarantee that when you are filing your returns electronically and you put in your identity pin, that the IRS is going to know that it is really you. So something to definitely check out. Now, you do need to get a new identity pin set up every year, and that's why you have the IRS account. And I know that might be a little bit of a pain, but it's good to have If you are filing a joint return, each of you need to have your own IRS account. See, people don't realize that the IRS looks at every single taxpayer as an individual. Whether you file jointly or not, each of you is an individual taxpayer in the IRS's eyes. So it's really important. And it's important to make sure you give that identity pin to your CPA or tax preparer that's doing your returns because I have had returns where I have gone to file, the client has forgotten to give me their identity pin and the filing of the form was rejected. And until I got that pin, I could not file the return. Here's the other reason to have your irs.gov account, not just to get your identity pin, not just for you to be able to access all of your tax information. But the other thing is, if you are having a CPA, a tax preparer, an enrolled agent prepare your return and they have questions and you are just not sure or you want them to have access, the CPAs can fill out a specific form, Form 8821, or a power of attorney. We can do this online now on our side. I have my own IRS account that's tied into my business. And if I need to request some tax transcripts or wage information from my client, if I send this form to my client through the portal and I do it electronically, and then they get that request on their end, they can give me permission. And of course, it's only for specific things. Like I filled out a form for a client and I just needed to look at their 2022 and 2021 years. They were new clients. I needed to just look at their information. And I sent the request through my irs.gov account. They saw it on their irs.gov account. They gave me permission. And then I was able to take a look at everything that I needed to take a look at for the tax return. And it's only for limited usage. I don't have access to everything related to your account. Hey, it's time for a money break. Welcome back from our money break. You can choose to have your return self-prepared. There are some free filing methods through the IRS. I know the state of Pennsylvania has something for the state. There's something called VITA, Volunteer Income Tax Assistance. So for those that are of lower income, you can go ahead and have your returns prepared by others, and it's through the IRS, and it's great to have that option out there. Or you can pay somebody like myself as a CPA or another tax professional or an enrolled agent to prepare your returns. But here's what I will tell you, and this is a caution. There is something out there called ghost preparers. A ghost tax preparer refers to an individual or an entity who offers tax preparation services without being officially registered or recognized by taxing authorities, such as the IRS. Now, for myself as a certified public accountant, CPA, not only did I have to go to school and take an exam, but I had to register with the state of Pennsylvania to get my license as a CPA. So I am licensed. And every two years, I'm required to do 80 hours of continuing education. So it's very important that you know that the person preparing your return is officially recognized, registered, et cetera. A ghost preparer could be operating illegally or without the necessary qualifications to prepare a tax return. And they're called ghost preparers because they often operate in the shadows and their activities can be fraudulent or deceptive. So here's some key characteristics, and these are important. There is something that all tax preparers are required to have. In fact, I just renewed mine. It's called a preparer tax 
identification number, PTIN. The IRS requires when I file the returns of my clients, I have to put in my PTIN number so they know that I am official. And it's issued by the IRS. Number two is fraudulent practices. Some ghost preparers engage in fraudulent practices, such as they could inflate deductions, hide income, create fake tax documents in an attempt to lower the client's tax liability. The practices are illegal and they really can lead to severe penalties to you, the taxpayer. You have to keep in mind, even if you have somebody preparing your return, at the end of the day, the person that is ultimately responsible for their tax return and the filing is you, the taxpayer. So you really have to be careful. Third, there's no signature. So a telltale sign of a ghost preparer is they refuse to sign the tax return that they prepared. Legitimate tax professionals like myself are required to sign the returns and, of course, provide their PTIN. So I'll take that a step further. Not only am I required, and I do, sign off on my tax returns, but I have an engagement letter for every single one of my clients, and I update this on an annual basis, even for returning clients. And basically, the engagement letter will lay out exactly what I'm preparing, when I need to prepare it by, what are my liabilities and responsibilities, what are the client's responsibilities and liabilities, and of course, my fee structure. So that is definitely important. Number four, cash payments. If the ghost preparer insists in being paid in cash, then that to me is a flag because it's making it difficult for you to trace or prove that the transaction ever occurred. What if you have someone prepared and they claim they filed it and then you come to find out six months later to a year later, they never filed it. You have no trail. So cash payments are definitely a red flag. Number five would be promising large refunds. Ghost preparers promise clients unusually large tax refunds. And this is a way for them to attract business and they manipulate their tax return information. That's how they get large refunds. Now, I will tell you, because I've had clients who have had large refunds and they were legitimate because we went through everything. We reviewed everything together. We made sure we had all the documentation. But there are people out there who are ghost preparers that promise. I never promise to my clients. What I always say is you may get a refund. You may owe money. So I definitely am very careful with how I communicate with my clients. And six, lack of transparency. So they're not necessarily going to provide clients with the copies of a completed tax return or any documentation, which makes it difficult for clients to understand how their tax return was prepared. And here's what I will say to you on that. I am very adamant with my clients that they review their returns before they sign off to have them filed. It's just really important that you review your return. Whether you are filing yourself or you're having somebody prepare for you, you really need to review that. And here's the thing. You need to check your name. You need to make sure your name is spelled correctly. You need to make sure your social security number is correct. You need to make sure those two things match because, again, those will cause the return to be rejected by the IRS and the state if those two things are not correct. So it's definitely important to go back through and review your return before you submit it because here's the thing. You can submit it and then three days later go, oh my gosh, I forgot to add this, I forgot to add that. Then now that's called an amended return and you need to go in and you have to amend the return or you file the return and you didn't look at things correctly and the IRS can come back and question things. And now you've got to go through the process of communicating with the IRS what the issues were and hopefully get that corrected. So it's important that you review. So engaging in a ghost tax repair is very risky for taxpayers. It can lead to inaccurate tax returns, potential legal issues, financial consequences. So you really have to make sure that you're trying to avoid these ghost tax preparers. And there's several ways you could do it. Of course, certified public accountant, CPA, which is what I am. There are enrolled agents and they go by EA. There's tax attorneys as well. But you can also ask for the qualifications and credentials of anybody that you are going to have your return being prepared for. So before you hire them, you can certainly ask to see their CPA license. I know in the state of Pennsylvania and probably in every state, you can go to the state board of licensure and look up to see if that person is truly who they say they are. And the IRS website has a great tool, and I can leave that link in the podcast blog, but they have a great tool on their website to have you search for qualified preparers in the area that you live. Some final thoughts. It helps if you stay organized throughout the year. Again, a lot of things are electronic now, so you can certainly create folders on like a Google Drive, a OneDrive for that. 
keeping your records and your receipts. And it does help when it comes time to having your return prepared. You should be keeping your documentation and tax returns for at least three years per the IRS, because at that point, the IRS for three years is still able to audit anything within that three-year period for your taxes. But keep this in mind that some documents and records should be kept for seven years if they're related to any filing of a claim for loss from worthless securities or bad debt deduction. So if you have any of that, you should be keeping that documentation for at least seven years. But the rule of thumb is three years. You should also consider some tax planning throughout the year. You can certainly talk to tax professionals or even financial planners to do some planning. These can minimize your tax liability. You can also do some simple tax planning and just kind of see every quarter, do I need to potentially pay an estimated tax payment? You know, that's basic. That's not talking about things when it comes to tax planning where it's, you know, do I need to make retirement contributions? Do I have to take advantage of some tax advantage savings plans? Is there ways within, if I have a small business and it's being reported on my personal return, what are the deductions that I could use to help maximize my income, but maybe minimize some of that tax liability. So it's just important to maybe review your finances throughout the year to see whatever tax consequences, as well as if you've had any changes, if you've moved, if you've changed jobs, if you don't have a job, those kinds of things can affect your taxes as well. So it's really good to review it throughout the year. Also, if you owe anything for your taxes, make sure that you pay them by the deadline when they're due. You can pay by check and you can pay electronically. There is a payment voucher. If you pay by check, you send it in the check with the voucher. You make sure your names are on it, your social security numbers are on the checks, and make sure they match the voucher. There are a lot of ways to pay electronically. If you're having someone prepare your return, they have the ability to do ACH or by credit card. You can ask them how they do that if they want, or you can tell them you can file, but I'm going to make the payment. And you can go to the IRS's website, and they have a place where it shows you can pay on your return. I know at least in Pennsylvania, you can go there directly to make a payment. And then, of course, if you live in PA and you go for local, you can pay directly on your local site. So there are definitely different ways to make sure that you pay, but you have to pay by that April 15th deadline, not the extension deadline. You have to make it for the April 15th. And if you don't make your payment by then, there could be interest and penalties. And really, that's the same thing if you're going to make any estimated tax payments. Individuals may be obligated to make estimated tax payments. Those are quarterly, but they go April 15th, June 15th, which is only two months, September 15th, and January 15th. So it's a little odd why the estimated tax payments are due that way, but that's what the IRS has and the states follow suit. And as always, you should consult with a tax professional for personalized guidance, especially if you have complex financial situations or you're unsure about specific tax laws in your state. And of course, if you are overseas and you're not in the United States, there could be some specific tax laws there. So you really need to pay attention. Hey, it's your financial maven, and I want to hear from you. Feel free to leave me your insights and money stories or questions that you may have about money. You can visit www.yourfinancialmavenpodcast.com and click on the I want to hear from you tab. I can't wait to hear what you have to say about money. The purpose of this podcast is to provide general information on the subjects discussed. It is for educational, informational, and entertainment purposes only. You should consult your CPA, accountant, or tax professional for all of your specific financial needs or situations. Your Financial Maven is hosted and produced by Samantha M. Besnoff, CPA, and Your Financial Maven, LLC. Editing is done by Chris Zarnock of KM Zen Creative. Music is written, composed, and performed by Daniel Shore. 